30 July 2020, 4.50 a.m. PD time. Welcome on board Rocket Atlas V541 as we take off from Launch Complex 41, Cape Canaveral Air Force Space Station. Our destination is Jezero Peter Mars. My boarding ticket number is M two M four nine four five seven four eight six one four one six. Booked on the first of June twenty nineteen. In twenty nineteen, NASA invited people from all over the world to submit their names so that they can accompany their Mars mission uh, or their Mars satellite or rocket uh, to Mars and these names were to be inscribed or written in a chip or on some whatever board and it would be left uh, on Mars at the completion of the, the mission. I responded since it was an exciting thing and uh, my name was submitted and as a result I got um, boarding pass uh, is on the spacecraft and that marked the beginning of a number of changes in my life and I also became very interested and keen in knowing what was happening from that time on until this moment. So, as a non-scientist or a, a partial scientist or a semi-scientist was I studied science uh, at one stage of my life, I was interested in that way. But surprisingly, I became to be more and more spiritual in terms of my natural life, social life, and I started to be more connected to my environment. And this uh, video that I'm going to produce is trying to reconcile uh, science and African spirituality and also to bring out the truth. While science can come up with facts, uh, or undisputed facts but without the human participation in the process the truth may be difficult to ascertain so vivid truth is human experience uh, so I don't have to question the processes uh, that uh, the scientists are doing or what they've come up with because I was a participant in the process. You know, although I was, you know, thousands of kilometers away from the, the scientists or thousands and or millions of kilometers away from Mars, I became connected with the scientists, uh, Mars, 
and their spacecraft. And that has led uh, me to certain conclusions. You know, you know, really, you know, as astonishing uh, conclusions about the planet Mars. And Mars, uh, as we know uh, from the scientific explanation and from previous missions, it's just rock and dust. But if we could listen to the eloquence of those rocks, if we could be able to tap into that, if we would be able to switch on those rocks and allow them to speak, we will definitely get the truth. We will definitely appreciate the truth. But that cannot be done scientifically only. You know, science is trying. They are taking samples of the rocks. They want to study those rocks. But this, the rocks have got their own language, which they can communicate to us human beings. So I'm one of the lucky few who was able to hear these rocks speak from their images and from the rocks that are found here on Earth. Uh, please allow me to point out at this uh, moment that uh, while the East, the North and the West were pursuing a different uh, scientific approach in trying to find answers to the mysteries of this uh, universe or this planet or our day-to-day -day lives. Africa was not sitting idle. Something was happening in Africa. And according to one of our great spiritual leaders, Baba Kredomoto, in his book, Indava My Child, Africa was busy. Let me quote uh, an excerpt of his book, which I also included in my book, uh, The Visitation. Open court. My son, for thousands of years, we, the chosen ones, have been trying to breed a new kind of man who will walk this earth without fear of flesh and blood enemies and who could offer defiance to some of the gods who hate us. Such a man, we hope, would use the forces of his brain, his mental power, to destroy his enemies. Instead of using spears and shields, such a man would not use his tongue to speak, but he would use the powerful voice of his mind to speak to both beasts and fellow men. There would be nothing hidden from this man who would be using the forces latent in our minds to do even the seemingly impossible things. He would be able to read the thoughts of birds and he would be able to swim against the current of the river time backwards into the past 
or forward into the future as he pleased. And my son, we are nearer to achieving this ideal today than most people think. Let me uh, start uh, on my journey, how it started. You know, I was just watching a TV program of people who, who, who had visited um, Inzalo Yelanga in Pumalanga, South Africa. And as I listened to their guide explaining about that place, you know, I got really very interested and listened carefully on the explanations. I would see rocks and rocks and rocks. Some were still standing erect uh, on the ground, while others had fallen. And as they gave the explanation, I started to see a different picture and that picture made me very, very inquisitive. And I decided to visit the place. We were lucky to find a guide to take us to that place, to Inzalo Yelanga, which is also known as Adam's Calendar. Because this place has been associated with uh, cosmology, that is, and uh, you know, the local people believe it's the birthplace of the sun. And uh, others also uh, talk of uh, its alignment with other planets in the universe. All those are explanations to try and find uh, the mystery around place. But as soon as I arrived there, I felt I was standing on a divine place. The environment itself was astounding. The feeling was magical. And immediately I said to myself, this is the place where Noah's Ark was made and finally anchored after the flooding. Uh, in, in my book, the, the Visitation, I wrote the following. Let me read it for you. While most African traditionalists tend to shun the Bible when it comes to African cultural studies. However, the danger in that approach is overlooking the witly evil hand of misdirection and disinformation. Like the cliche, if you want to hide information from an African, put it in writing. I may paraphrase that statement to God. If you want to hide life-changing information from an educated African, put it in the Bible. Close quote. So, it's common knowledge that uh, most scientists and the educated people 
shun uh, the Bible and they don't want to bring religion in, into their research. But the danger in that is we may miss very important information which should lead us to major discoveries. You know, uh, from an African point of view, the religion was brought by colonialists, so especially uh, Christianity and the Bible itself. But the stories which are contained therein may be African stories which were usurped, pillaged, and then reproduced as stories of a different race. We cannot, under any circumstance, avoid oral history because before there was writing, before there was print, before there was the camera, there was oral traditional history. And once we miss that, we may spend years, hours and hours, trying to find something that is right in our face. So, I, like I said previously, that I'm going to try and reconcile science and African spirituality I think including other religions as well because the discoveries that are coming out of Mars are universal they will touch everybody and may lead to everyone having to take certain actions in order to solve our own problem or in order to understand how we have got where we are now. The photographs which you are going to see were taken almost two months before the uh, Perseverance rover landed on Mars and uh, after having a, a looked at some of the pictures that were coming from Mars, uh, the temptation was to revisit in Zaloela and, you know, take the pictures and videos uh, so that they would probably suit or appeal, have a more appeal to, to the audience. But, you know, I felt as if it was going to be more of trying to manipulate the, the audience and even manipulating myself, then that's why I decided to resort to the original pictures. Uh, our guide, uh, Edwin Chitabi, who took us uh, on this uh, tour of the monument, uh, as we approached uh, the monument, he then said to, to us, look, I knew that somebody special was going to visit uh, in Zaloelanga today. You know, I asked him, how so? 
how did you know that um, you're coming and uh, how can you tell that we are special visitors? Because there was really nothing special about us. Uh, but he went on to explain that he had a dream. And in the dream he had seen a huge snake which was uh, moving up, putting its head up and then down and while it was moving around towards the uh, tree that you see in the picture there. So then if you take that from the African perspective, you understand what he was talking about. Because in the African perspective, uh, the snake, especially the python, is an ancestral uh, snake. Uh, Africans are not allowed to kill pythons. Uh, and they are spiritual uh, in nature. Therefore, that's how he linked uh, our visit to important or special guests or visitors. And then as we move on, we shall see the importance of the snake or the python uh, in the whole Mars-Earth connection. Let the eloquence of the rocks be heard. You know, these rock structures that you see here, which are identical or similar, rather, with the ones found at Inzalo Yelang, at Adam's calendar. If you look at those rocks, those the big ones there, And then compare with the ones that I took pictures of. You see some similarities. And then you also see two parallel lines of boulders on the picture that came out of Mars which you also find on the pictures which I took at Inzalo Yelanga is illustrated uh, in, uh, on, on this picture. Therefore, these similarities are not mere Coincidence. Something must have been happening. And then, if you look to the right of the, this picture from uh, Mars, taken by Curiosity rover, you see that there is that rock which is lion shaped. It looks like a lion if you look at it closely. Surprisingly, at Inzalo Elanga we have a similar rock uh, which is uh, on this picture. And you can see there my wife is sitting on top of that rock and then that will be able to give you the size or the measurements of, of the rock. Uh, one interesting feature is where did these rocks uh, come from? How did they end up here? Such huge, massive rocks. And if you look at the bedrock which is found around here, it doesn't match uh, these huge uh, rocks that we see here. 
Uh, therefore, you know, that really, you know, boggles the mind as you try to understand uh, where these rocks came from, but also looking at the bedrock, there are a lot of similarities with those that are found on Mars. If you happen to look closely at those uh, rocks, you see that the way they are cut is quite synonymous with equipment and machinery, you know, that we witness every day on our daily lives. But then these are ancient rocks. You know, if you also look at uh, where uh, Mr. Chitabi is pointing on that rock, you can see that a drilling machine was used in the process of cutting that rock. Who did that? Where did that happen? But again, we see similarities with the rocks that were pictured on Mars, where these rocks appear to have been cut by equipment, uh, machinery, to give th those shapes that we see. Uh, earlier on, I mentioned uh, the story of Noah, the, the story of the ark, that this is the place that uh, Noah's ark could have anchored. Then how did I come to such uh, a weird uh, conclusion? But if you look at uh, the entire picture, you see these particular rocks here which show that something must have huge, something massive, must have pushed these rocks as they are said to have uh, been broken right at the surface. They were broken into two pieces where we have one piece which is lying on the ground and other, the other pieces are still uh, embedded you know, in the earth below. So it's, it's an indication that something massive must have pushed these rocks as it was coming to a halt. Uh, look at this other rock again. It gives evidence of a massive object having pressed that rock until it cracked in such a way. Those cracks are quite synonymous with weight being exerted on a hard surface. Uh, this is one of the many rocks which are found at Enzailo Yelanga, which clearly shows lines of erosion which were caused by water flow. So you can tell from this rock that the entire place at one time was completely submerged in water and the levels started to drop, leaving those lines uh, of erosion. That again gives us uh, that kind of story. Uh, and pushes the idea of uh, the no uh, Noah's Ark. And if we read the story of Noah, uh, we get to learn that when the water had subsided, Noah had to send uh, the raven then the dove to go and check if, if the ground surface was now habitable. The position of the monument 
certain certainly answers to to that because no no one knew he was on high ground and he wanted to search the ground below and see if it was now uh, habitable but why would he send uh, the raven and the dove yet all along noah was communicating with directly with god according to the story it shows that when his ark anchored onto this uh, place it destroyed the portal it destroyed the receiver and now he was not capable of communicating with with god or oh, the total communication link had been destroyed then that takes us to the a monument on Mars which could have probably bent down and the rock structure and the magnetism that is contained in the rocks and the waves that are contained in those rocks it disappeared that then brings up the question what caused the flood? Is it heat from the sun or it was heat from somewhere else? The, you know, the, the most uh, logical conclusion is that the destruction of Mars, the destruction of life on Mars was uh, resulted in massive heat being produced. Mars was actually bent down. And when that was happening, that's when the people on Mars communicated with those on Earth to tell them that you guys, we are burning. And if the heat that is being produced here gets to earth, all the ice caps are going to melt and there's going to be flooding. So prepare. That's when Noah started to build the ark. And he was building it within the environs of the monument. Because that's when he, he was close to the communication to the receiver. Because I call this uh, monument a receiver. Or it would also transmit dead both functions. Or we can safely call it a broadcasting station where the communication between Earth and Mars was taking place. But I've also linked this place to a great Zimbabwe monument which I call Shikiro Rewiriti monument that there was also communication between Inzaloyelanga uh, Great Zimbabwe uh, Shikiro Rewiriti and the other monolithic uh, monuments that we witness today on earth so that's the origins of the story of noah and the ark and it will be fair it, to conclude that the beginning of the end of the Ice Age was a result of heat that was emitted
from Mars. When Mars was getting destroyed. And imagine they hated to travel 504 million kilometers and in space for that matter. That was massive with very little conduction, very little or no convectional currents, but the heat arrived on Earth. I think it, at that point, Mars became like the sun and the way the heat is transmitted from the sun to Earth is this similar situation. So it will be very difficult uh, given the temperatures that were witnessed on Mars to find evidence of life. Life was totally destroyed. It was banned beyond recognition whether scientifically or any other means. So it becomes very uh, obvious that our only source of information becomes the rocks themselves. As the Mars exploration unfolds, it is also important to constantly visit the words of our great Credo uh, Mutwana and see if the Africans have managed to bring about or to create this kind of man that uh, he envisaged. A man who is capable of unlocking or releasing the memory which is stored in the primordial cell and reveal to mankind memories or events which happened millions of years ago. Just like the instincts that we see in birds, that a bird is not taught how to make a nest, but all that is stored within its genes. So as, as humans, we have that capability that we don't need to be taught of the things that happened millions of years ago. All we need is to be able to release that energy and to be in that spiritual realm for us to be able to link the happenings that are happening today and whatever happened or transpired millions and millions of years ago. And I'm sure by the end of it all, we will all be enlightened. I spoke of the snake and its importance to African spirituality and here at this um, uh, on earth at this Nzal uh, Elanga monument we have this uh, huge rock that you see on the picture which is known as the snake rock as it looks like a snake while at the same time we have uh, photographs of a rock structure which looks like a, a snake, a python in particular, which also came out of uh, mud. 
then that link is, is very important. And it, it must be understood and be accepted by people in their rightful mind. One cannot avoid noticing that uh, small rock placed on top of the huge rock, just in front of that uh, snake sculpture. You know, and then you compare it with the one that you see on the middle rock there, which is placed right on top. You know, those similarities. You know, and the question is, who placed these small rocks there? The donut-shaped rock, which was photographed uh, on Mars. See, when we returned to, to the museum, our guide showed us a number of donut-shaped rocks. And these are said to possess high energy. I'm Edwin Chitapi again, and I'm here uh, just to show you some pieces of uh, very ancient evidence of stone tools and artifacts that we have in our museum here at uh, the Waterville Museum, um, Waterville Boven Museum. And um, you will be surprised, um, actually speaking or pointing out to you at this very particular uh, stone tool that I'm pointing at, uh, the one which has uh, a wall in the middle. And uh, this stone tool is a very ancient uh, stone uh, tool and artifacts. Well, Baba Credo Mutua calls it an ancient stone tool or he calls it a sacred stone. It was also used in very ancient uh, shamanic uh, ceremonies uh, in African civilizations very ancient African civilizations. The energy and the waves that are produced by these donut-shaped rocks can reach millions of miles from Earth. And these are probably why some of the rocks that were part of the whole communication uh, system, maybe by sounding them, uh, producing certain chords, or they would carry voices. Yeah. If you look at this rock, uh, those who study Egyptology and archaeology have suggested that it's the, or it, or rather, it depicts the Horus uh, hawk. But if you look at closely at the shape of the, the neck of that rock. It's a concave shaped, very smooth. Yet hawks and eagles, they have more of convex uh, shaped uh, necks then that on its own uh, removes any notion that uh, this sculpture, this rock sculpture is of a hawk or an eagle. But it can be closely linked to the African green pigeon. To the Wiriti, because it is the Wiriti that has got a smooth, concave neck, a, a white bill, and therefore this monument is closely linked to. Superiority monument that is Great Zimbabwe, where the other uh, small but significant uh, stone sculptures 
are found. Uh, we shall talk about those uh, sculptures that are found at Shikro uh, Rewiriti when time permits. So, the link of this uh, stone to the Wiriti beds and the eyes of the Wiriti beds and the donut uh, stones that we talked about and the communication, the, the energy that's a, which is found on the uh, on these donut rocks and the shape of the Wiriti eyes which also depicts uh, the donut shape you know brings the whole communication into perspective and also the fact that uh, Noah is said to have picked a dove you know which probably could have been the Tyrone Calva, you know, because this is oral history, uh, which was passed on from generation to generation, suggests that the, the Tyrone Calva was a communication bed. We can also talk about the other uh, monuments that are found around that area which are built uh, of stone and these stones that you see here on these monuments cannot be traced of their origins these stones but for those who have seen pictures of the stones that uh, are found on Mars, they look exactly like this stone. Some have called them the blueberry rocks, and all sorts of names have been given to these names, uh, to these stones that are found on, uh, on Mars. Therefore, again, the stones, the rocks, are being very eloquent. And it takes us with surprise that we cannot add this up and really see that there was a link or this strong link between Mars and Earth and that life once existed and that life was uh, in touch with life on earth. Uh, another interesting piece of evidence uh, is to do with uh, most religions on earth today where the month of November is said to be sacred. Uh, I know definitely in my Shona culture, the month of November is a sacred month and there's no activity, no ceremonies, uh, which are allowed to be performed during the month of November. But then the month of November is uh, arbitrary. And the reason why uh, the month of November uh, has been selected to be uh, the sacred month emanates from these pictures that you see which were taken in November uh, where Mars is behind the sun and when that happens, there is no communication. Communication becomes impossible between Mars and Earth. Uh, the Perseverance rover 
experienced that when you know uh, the sun now the sun was uh, between uh, Mars and Earth. The scientists could not communicate with uh, the rover. Therefore, our ancestors experienced that phenomenon and realized that whatever ceremonies, be it marriage, be it uh, Thanksgiving or other similar ceremonies, the ancestors, you know, the gods or the people who were at Ma on Mars were not, being, were not going to bless them because they would not know anything about them. And that's the reason why that month is important. And if that phenomenon uh, applies or happens every now and then, then wisdom detects that. As long as we are not able to see Mars from Earth, we are not supposed to perform any rituals, any ceremonies. And again, that is evidence from the past, which shows that there was communication, there was link, there was life on Mars. And in Zaloyelang is full of mysteries. So is Mars. One uh, particular uh, mystery which is which I found to be common with uh, both places, Mars and Inzaloyelanga, is their effect on cameras. Uh, the pictures that I've shown you, I don't appear in any of those uh, pictures that were taken at uh, Inzaloyelanga, despite having asked my wife to take me uh, pictures and uh, even asked uh, our guide Chitapi to uh, take us pictures. It means the pictures that were taken by my wife and by Mr. Chitapi, which were supposed, which I was supposed to be um, on them or in them, uh, vanished. <laughs> the camera could not take uh, photos of me whilst I was at this uh, special monument. Now, we have also got reports that the Ingenuity helicopter it to crash land on a number of times because it had failed to take photographs and that baffled the scientists and they have not found a, an explanation of that. So there are certain energies uh, found on Mars which are also found on Inzalo Yela. And that is very important, that is very special. Uh, our visit to uh, the monument wasn't incident free. We witnessed a lot of interference. There was uh, this guy who was calling our guide, he was persistently calling to uh, trying to get directions to, to the monument. You know, and that was terrible, horrible, to, to, to be honest. Uh, again, those are similarities that we witness when the rover got interference. You know, there were strange sounds that were recorded on Mars, which were interfering with the, its entire processes. And then, out of the blue, uh, our tour guide 
just talks about you know, certain people that we know and that we were we had previously discussed about. You know, I was taken aback, <laughs> really shocked. And I didn't interrogate him further because I thought maybe I was the only one who was, you know, <laughs> hearing what he was saying. And when we were a distance away from him, my wife also asked me, did you hear what he said? You know, I can't dwell uh, on the conversation and or mention the names, but uh, that kind of connection. And then we decided, no, we must ask him. We must interrogate him further. And on interrogation, he, he, he uh, proclaims ignorance. He says he, he never talked about that. He doesn't know those people. He's never met those people. See, so such places was it him who was talking or it was the rocks that was sending a message to us and to be honest whatever he said actually came to fruition but he claimed not to have said it. So that's how spiritual in Zaloyelanga is. Even the inanimate, that is the rover and the helicopter, experienced the eloquence of the rocks. Some refused to have samples of them taken others demanded a hike on the rover and others could not be taken photographs therefore there is no doubt that the rocks have spoken so in, in conclusion, uh, one would safely say life once existed on Mars and that there was direct communication between Mars and Earth. Uh, the second conclusion would be that the Ice Age was a result of the destruction of Mars, the heat that was produced during that uh, period of destruction is the one that was transmitted to Earth, which reached Earth, and ignited the, the, the end of the Ice Age. So that is very important. And that uh, the destruction of Mars was communicated to Earth and, and, the, and the inhabitants of Earth took certain precautions to avoid the total human and animal disaster and that's where the story of Noah emanates from. The, the Wiriti birds are divine emissaries. They, they receive messages from afar. They communicate those messages to people on earth. And it's entirely up to us to take the necessary steps like what our ancestors did during the melting of the ice and avoided the total demise of life on earth. Therefore, we cannot rely on science alone 
is we pursue life on this planet. The evidence is now clear that there's need in, or an urgent need of reconciling science and spirituality if we are going to get solutions that will serve this planet. There are people who can understand birds. There are people who can encode and decode the language of stone. And that is very paramount. Guided by uh, African spirituality, I think I can safely say that I became a ground astronaut. My voyage from Pretoria to Inzalo Yelanga at a time when the NASA scientists were preparing to take off uh, on their mission to, or to send their rocket to Mars, I became the precursor. I became <coughs> the porter. I you know, got to know of what's happening uh, on Mars, what happened on Mars before even the satellites arrived there, before the rover landed on Mars.